Now he can hear you. Go ahead. Frank, turn your video on. There he is. Are we good? Yes, we're good. Except they can't okay. see you. Blackout. Um, I, here, here, get ready. You ready? I'm gonna pull the curtain back. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're on, by the way. We're rolling. Okay. <laughs> Just, okay. Hold on. Hold on. We're, we're actually rolling here. So I'm gonna call the okay. <laughs> city commission meeting for you. City order for Wednesday, January third, twenty twenty. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith here. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Present. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Here. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Present. And Mayor Dan Holliday. Here. Uh, as usual, until we get through this uh, Zoom time period, we're gonna dispense with the flag salute for tonight. Uh, under ceremonies, proclamations, presentations, I have something I'm gonna say, um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Band. And then we'll have the presentation from Mr. Uh, LaSalle. So first off, I want to say that I am, uh, I have withdrawn myself as the city's representative to the West Advisory Committee. In my place, I have appointed Commissioner uh, Smith. Uh, he has uh, agreed to take on that role. Um, and I will serve as a uh, as an alternate should uh, should Commissioner Smith not be able to attend and something serious be going on there. Um, the other thing I want to say is I have spent um, almost five and a half years being mayor, and during that time period I have struggled mightily to make sure that we are not taking up our time or the citizens' time with issues that are not directly impactful to Oregon City or something that we as Oregon City commissioners can uh, can make a decision or, or, or directly impact. Um, and that includes you know, anything from abortion to the Second Amendment to all kinds of other issues that other city councils and commissions might take a, a resolution on or have discussion about because I don't believe that what we do here um, has any real impact on either state or national issues. And we have enough work to do for the citizens of Oregon City uh, to spend time doing things that we can't affect. So with that said, um, I've had a lot of people on social media, other things saying that I should say all kinds of different things about what is going on right now in this country. And the only thing I'm gonna say about that is, is that Oregon City has one of the finest police forces in the state. They are as highly trained as, as any men and women in law enforcement can possibly be. Um, we have the highest quality of leadership uh, in Chief Band and, and Captains Clur and Davis and, and the rest of the, the officer corps there. And uh, I have every, every faith that all of our officers do not consider anything other than what's going on right in front of them at the time. They do not discriminate based on race, sexual orientation, or any other thing. And if something like what happened in Minneapolis were to begin or start in an interaction here in Oregon City, I have every faith that, uh, that the officer who is, who is doing something wrong would be stopped by his fellow officers or his sergeant or lieutenant or captain or chief and that that person would be immediately suspended or fired and prosecuted if necessary. So with that, I have every faith and confidence in the Oregon City Police Department. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Ban. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, good evening, uh, Commission. Um, so I've just got a, a statement I'm gonna read briefly um, that has to do with um, everything that has been happening, uh, George Floyd, uh, everything that's going on across this country. Um, we had several conversations about making statements about this, and uh, it's been an interesting time. Uh, a lot of people are saying things, and it seemed, for me at least initially, like a time to listen. I've, I've had some great interaction with people in the community about the need to hear something from us, uh, and after several conversations, uh, I just put something together uh, that is a statement that, uh, that I want to read. 
Uh, like you, we are all processing the images and video of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the protests that have been taking place across the country. There's much more healing and reconciliation needed across our nation, state, and here at home. I know that we, what we choose to do here sets the tone for generations to come. In leading this department, I can tell you that hiring, retention, accountability, and leadership are all integral elements to a good police agency. I can promise you that our focus on those things is the reason that you have never seen an Oregon City police officer in the news related to anything like this or, or anything of this nature. Um, I'm not saying that we never make mistakes, but we focus on being good at what we do every day. We resist complacence, complacency and are constantly looking for better ways to serve our community. As a police officer for more than 21 years, tragic situations like the one involving George Floyd are difficult uh, for me and our officers to process. I work with a team at the department that is dedicated to serving. They take immense pride in that service, and so do their families. Seeing someone in uniform destroy that trust is painful, and it makes me angry. It also fuels my fire to keep working as hard as we have, reinforcing accountability to the community and to each other. This event and others drive me to make sure that we at the police department are at our very best. We are committed to continuing to work to keep our community safe and welcoming for black people and people of all colors. George Floyd died a tragic death. While it did not happen in this community, the impacts are certainly here. We can't change what happened, but can certainly learn from it and do everything we can to make sure that we are better in the future because of it. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. So um, the last thing I'm gonna say is, is that the last thing we're gonna talk about that tonight. Uh, individual commissioners, if you have a uh, desire to make a comment or, or uh, something like that, feel free to write to the newspaper or to do it in social media or some other form, but we're not going to use this dais uh, to talk about those issues, just like I talked about at the beginning. May um, I thank you, though? No, you may not. May I say thank you? Okay, sure. Thank you. Okay, so moving on from there, Mr. Uh, LaSalle. Crosswalk safety concerns in Park Place in Berkeley's neighborhood by Ms. Rosal is currently the still the chair of the Park Place neighborhood. Yes. Pardon me. You still the chair of Park Place? No, I'm not the chair anymore of okay. Park Place. Right. I'm the chair of the CIC. Okay. And uh, with your permission, all this serious business going on around us, I'd like to take a couple of minutes for a little levity. Sure. These uh, three guys all went up to heaven at the same time. And they're standing in front of St. Saint, uh, McGriff, as a matter of fact, because St. Peter was on vacation. So she looked him over and she thought, well, you guys are a pretty good looking bunch of fellows. I think I'll let you in. There's only one serious thing we've got going here. He says, she says is, do not step on a duck. Do not do that. Well, they looked at each other, that shouldn't be very hard. So about 100 years goes by, and she calls them back in, because, you know, vacations are kind of long up there, so Pete's still on vacation, and uh, McGriff is still there at the Pearly Gates. And she calls Dan over, and she says, come here, Dan. So he goes over there. She says, you did it. He says, well, I know I didn't mean to. I was just walking around talking to some of the mayors and plotting them how do we make them changes up here and make things better. He says, yeah, but she, she has still stepped on a duck. So she motions over to the clouds. The ugliest woman you ever saw in your life comes out of these clouds. I mean, she is just incredibly ugly. You wouldn't believe anybody in the world could be that ugly. He pulls out the shackles and she shackles them together. Off they go. About 500 years later, why she calls him back. She's still there, he's still on vacation. And uh, she says, come here, Rocky. Rocky walks over there. He says, I didn't do anything. He says, I've been teaching extracurricular art classes and doing everything right. Yeah, but you did it. You stepped on a duck. 
Well, out comes this woman. Oh, oh, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, she's got snakes in her hair and bolts coming out of her ears and her eyeballs are like two red coals. He shackles them together. Off they go. It's about a thousand years later, why she calls them all in there. He calls poor old Frank over. Come here, Frank. And Frank was scared to death. So, oh my God, what did I do? She motions over to the clouds, and out comes this incredibly beautiful woman. I mean, you wouldn't believe how beautiful this woman is. And so St. Peter is back by this time, and he says, I'd like you to introduce yourself, young lady. And she says, well, mine is Cleo. My last name is Patrick. And uh, meanwhile, Frank's sitting there. He's wondering, what did I do to deserve this? My gosh, this is incredible. And he looks at this gal, and he says, what did you do? He says, well, I don't know what you did, but I stepped on a duck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay, moving on. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, for allowing me this time. My name is Bob LaSalle, and I live in Oregon City. I've been asked by the Park Place and Barkley Hills Neighborhood Association to address the issue of crosswalks in those neighborhoods. The Park Place Neighborhood Association is asking that the transportation system plan crosswalks on Holcomb Boulevard be raised in their priority. Park Place is experiencing the largest development of any other neighborhood in Oregon City, and Holcomb Boulevard is becoming a more dangerous street as we speak. This map shows the recently completed, currently under construction, or soon to be developed areas in Park Place, all those red hash marks, quite an area. I'm gonna give you some figures to think about. The 2017 volume traffic study by Quality Counts LLC shows at Holcomb Boulevard and Redland Road, a daily count of 9,370 trips. A 2018 transportation impact study by Lancaster Engineering stated a daily increase of 7,401 daily trips will be generated by the development of the recently annexed portion of the Park Place concept plan. Now that doesn't include the daily trips generated by the currently developing old airfield property on Holcomb Boulevard, which is 98 new dwellings, or the recently annexed Sears property on Holcomb Boulevard, 124 new dwellings. Those could be an additional 2,220 trips, daily trips, going up and down Holcomb Boulevard. That comes to a grand total of 9,626 additional daily trips, more than doubling today's trips and challenging even the most nimble pedestrians such as I. Compared to other areas of Oregon City, Park Place is a pedestrian safety wasteland. Let's compare some other streets in Oregon City. Now keep in mind that Holcomb Boulevard from Redland Road east to the city limits is a distance of 1.9 miles with no traffic signals, no stop signs, and no crosswalks. Malala Avenue from Highway 213 to Beaver Creek Road, a distance of eight tenths of a mile, has or soon will have five traffic signals and two crosswalks. Malala Avenue from Beaver Creek Road to Division Street, a distance of 1.4 miles, has four traffic signals and two crosswalks. Seventh Street from Division to Singer Hill, a distance of six tenths of a mile, has two traffic signals and two crosswalks. High Street from Singer Hill to Second Street, a distance of four tenths of a mile, has five crosswalks. Warner Parrot, Warner Milne Roads, South End Road to Malala Avenue, a distance of 1.8 miles, have four traffic signals and two crosswalks. Washington Street from Seventh Street to Home Depot, 
a distance of 1.4 miles as six traffic signals and two crosswalks. It should be noticed that most crosswalk, I mean, most traffic signals, of course, have four crosswalks. I presented this information to the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Citizen Involvement Committee. Both committees have given their unanimous support in asking that these crosswalks, which are already listed on the transportation system plan, be raised in their priority and be funded by any means possible as soon as possible. We've been told there's a possibility of funding being provided by grants from the Safe Routes to Schools program, but there aren't any assurances of that happening. I, I'd love to say that Dana from uh, City Engineer Dana has been very good at keeping us informed of their latest uh, attempts to, to follow up on these Safe Routes to Schools. She's done a great job and we thank her for that. Uh, <clears throat> But with the upcoming developments, we'd like to be proactive rather than reactive. Of course, the lack of money is always brought up, and I don't pretend to be an expert on the city budget, but my research has found that funds can be realloc reallocated if needed. For example, at the June 15th, 2011 city commission meeting, on the agenda was the item, reallocation of budget funds to the visionary process whatever that is. Within the budget, I found the following information in the public works section. Engineering contingency, 922,000. Transportation contingency, 969,000. Pavement maintenance contingency, 934, almost 35,000. Water contingency, 1,113,000. Wastewater contingency, 8 million. 375 and stormwater contingency $1,393,000,000. In the past, I've heard the term in regard to budget items, uh, placemats. Well, Park Place is ready to take their place at the table. The budget states in regard to transportation system development provide transportation system improvements that add system safety or increase level of performance or level of service to accommodate orderly growth and development in Oregon City. If all the development in Park Place doesn't qualify for that, I don't know what does. Considering the proposed increase in traffic on Holcomb Boulevard, the citizens in Park Place are requesting that all four crosswalks listed in the TSP be constructed by any means possible, as soon as possible, and be of the pedestrian activated flashy lights type. Now, let's consider the crosswalks for the Barkley Hills neighborhood. All the crosswalks they're concerned about are on Malala Avenue. Lala Avenue is one of the busiest streets in Oregon City with an average daily trip count of more than 20,000 trips. Recently, ODOT addressed the safety issues at Malala and Pearl Street, and hopefully the safety at that intersection will be addressed soon. There's a definite safety issue at the crosswalk at Malala and Barclay Drive. That's where the Chevron Station and the Grocery Outlet and Barclay Hills Vet are located. The possibility of driver distraction is high due to the amount of activity in the area, especially at night. And the citizens of Barkley Hills are asking that all the crosswalks in their neighborhood be upgraded to the intermittent flashing light variety. Their support from the city involvement committee was also unanimous. Now I've heard the figure of upward of $100,000 for construction of these types of uh, crosswalks. Now think about that. That's 25% of the cost of a very nice home. $400,000 home. And if that's true, my way of saying well, something's wrong here. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so anyway, that's uh, 
All I have, thank you for your time, and I'll try to answer any questions on this subject that you might have. Thank you, sir. Commissioner, you have any questions? Um, my question's for Mr. Lewis. Um, can you clarify if SDCs can be used for crosswalks? Generally, yes. Um, most of them are listed in TSP. There's a portion of them. If you're, um, we probably won't recall this a pretty fine detail, but for all pedestrian improvements, SDCs can attribute to 39% of that project. And that was something that came out of the SDC analysis and the, the master plan for transportation. So yes, um, SDCs can and do cover some of those kinds of projects. And can you um, explain what contingency funds are used for right. in those categories? So um, I would say some of the contingencies that Bob listed are, are at um, a level, and Wyatt could probably speak better to this, that is kind of an industry standard for where we keep our contingency. That in other words, there's not a lot of extra or there's not a they wouldn't advocate for us to dip into that contingency too much in case something, some kind of an emergency came up. Sewer fund, for instance, with the $8 million contingency has got more to do with this ramped up program that we just talked about tonight, which is, yes, it's high, but it's also intent. The expectation was we were gonna spend down those monies at you know over $2 million a year. So that would be spent down pretty quickly. I think SDCs is another example of that where we've um, been saving some money for Larger projects, Myers Road, for instance, is a good example of that. 100% of that project was SDC funded. So we carried a pretty big fund balance and then now we're spending it down significantly. So um, fund balance, I mean, um, yeah, the, the contingency, I'm gonna leave that to Wyatt if, since he's in the room to maybe do a better job of explaining the, something about uh, what he feels is important about that contingency. But in other funds, there's definitely there, I would say, depending on the capital improvement plan, they may be uh, underfunded or not enough, not as much as we'd like to see in there. And then lastly, I'd say I was surprised by Mr. LaSalle's figure of 100,000 for a crosswalk. I, my understanding was 35,000 was more of a reasonable average cost for those crosswalks. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so um, I think if the crosswalk has been ADA, um, Americans with Disability Act kind of upgraded, like a lot of the a lot of the locations that we take care of under PMUF, we update all those ramps. <clears throat> And in the case of like Barkley Hills, for instance, there's some of those ramps that were done 2007-ish, 2008. They met the standard of the time. Those ADA standards have changed a little bit. We're actually gonna do that one and not try to do a bunch of sidewalk replacement there. So it really depends on how much sidewalk replacement. It also depends on, you know, meter and how much, you know, how where you're gonna put the pedestrians. Does the island, stay or go. So each one's a little different scenario. I would say the one on 7th right here by the library, <clears throat> much less expensive because we were able to work within the confines of the existing ramps. And really it was just a matter of getting conduit and electrical to it and buying the equipment. So those are generally less. Um, the one on Barkley Hills, we just signed a contract with Kittleson to uh, do the design work for us on that. And that involves work with the county on, the county does most of our signal maintenance, so making sure that we're meeting a standard that they're used to maintaining, so interaction with them, and then just the design work, most of which is used, done using our existing mapping, right? We're not gonna do a lot of survey work on that, but that's a $15,000 contract, and then the, we'll, we'll low bid that, right? Or we'll bid that, and we'll likely um, solicit either quotes or bids for that and go with the low bid on that. So we'll see that number soon, but yeah, it depends. I mean, the we've got one plan for um, Lynn Avenue near the police department for the new um, school access road right there on, I'm forgetting one, which side street it is, but um, Winston, I think. So, you know, that one's gonna involve some sidewalk repairs on both sides. It's gonna be more expensive. <laughs> So it's kind of like you just said that the Barkley Hills crosswalk is being looked at? Or yes, being oh, oh, these these all are, by the way. I, I just wanna, the, the, the difference is, is how soon do we really fund them? But we are serious about pursuing grant funding for Holcomb. We think it makes, it's, it's 
high likelihood that it will um, be successful. We can't guarantee that, but because of the, um, the, the school and it's, I forget the term, but it, it's, it's a lower income school. So that generally scores higher with the grant. So we think we're gonna be pretty successful with that one. We're also pursuing um, a, a teaching. Stand by. We're, we're also sure. pursuing a, okay. a TGM grant for the Park Place area in general because there's a lot of streets in that neighborhood that, we, yeah, we have a transportation system plan that suggests we do sidewalks or bike lanes or what this, we, we need to know more details on that. So as a small development comes in, we can actually say, well, you need to put your curbs you know, here. Are you gonna have a sidewalk? Is it gonna be a curb tied sidewalk? Is it gonna be a sidewalk with a planter strip? So that's another grant that we're gonna to bring to you and ask for your support before we submit on, but we're hoping that we get that. That's a smaller grant, but it'll be a good, it'll be a grant similar to what we did with um, the Lynn Leland Myers Road corridor project to try and better articulate clearly so that when the development comes in, we know what we can do with that. So you didn't answer the question, which is, is it 35,000 or is it more like 100,000 or is it somewhere in the middle? It's probably somewhere in the middle. Our TSP, our TSP uses 35,000 and that's what we use to establish SDCs. We set those okay, I so think in 2012. If we assume 50 grand a piece for the sidewalk, for the crosswalks, how many crosswalks are you talking about, Mr. LaSalle? Six? On, um, in Holcomb, there, there would be four in and, the transportation and system. And two in Berkeley plan. Hills, right? Hmm? And two in Berkeley Hills? One uh, that we know of. I believe they're Dude, all the one existing at, ones. So the one at, I uh, didn't count them. We're talking right? about the one at Platt Pantry and the one at, uh, at, at Grocery Outlet, right? Yeah, and is there one down by the coffee shop down there? I'm not sure. Coffee, Used uh, to be there's, Big Dog. No, the uh, you're talking about Dutch Brothers. Dutch Brothers, yeah. Thing, yeah. So there is a there is a lighted a light crosswalk there. there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you're talking about three hundred thousand dollars, right? Roughly. If if we spent that money, um, and let's assume the two hundred grand for uh, uh, Park Place, and you were to apply for a grant, could we get reimbursed for the stuff that we already done in that grant? No, reimbursements typically aren't the way grants work. I mean, we can't build it first and then apply for a grant and try and get reimbursed. We can't uh, we could most, add other stuff into the grant if we'd already built the crosswalks, right? Uh, possibly. Seems to me that if the citizens came to us and said, you know, we, need, we want to have these as a safety issue, and I can attest to the one at Grocery Outlet because I live just a few blocks from there, um, and especially at night, people people trying to cross there, you can't see people. Um, and, you know, if somebody gets stranded in that, you know, island in the middle, it's even harder. Uh, seems to me we could find the $300,000. We're doing um, the one, we are doing the one at, at Barclay Hills. Okay. But the one down the hill at just, uh, would be just south of Plaid Pantry is just as bad in the dark. There isn't a street light there. So you have the same issue of people crossing, uh, you know, a dark road at night. And, you know, we start talking about going into the winter time with fog and the other kinds of obstructions. Um, it seems to me that that's pretty, that's a pretty cheap price to, you know, take care of. I hear about pedestrian and bikes all the time. This is something that actually makes sense to me versus some of the silly things we do with bike paths and some other things. So, uh, in my opinion, I think we ought to find the money. Um, I, I can comment. I, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's a great idea. My only concern is that there are a lot of neighborhoods. I live in Gaffney Lane. I live on Myers. There are a couple of crosswalks, and I can tell you, I've been there plenty of times, and people don't stop. I have to be in the road to try to get right. people's attention. I would love to have those crosswalks lighted, you know, or lit, whatever the correct term is. I think it's lighted, but anyway. Um, so it kind of I mean, opens Pandora's box of- Well, I, of, I might agree know. with you, with the exception that when you're talking about on Myers Road, for instance, mm -hmm. um, those are all pretty much just recreational crosswalks. 
So those are folks that are out and about the neighborhood kind of thing. The, the places that we're, that I'm talking about in Barkley Hill especially, those are really commercial crosswalks. Those are people going back and forth from the apartments down in the canyon to grocery outlet or people yeah. in the neighborhood going to Plaid Pantry. Um, so they have a tendency to be used more, um, especially at night, than the crosswalks might be on Myers Road or Gaffney Lane or some of the others. Um, I, I'm just advocating because I, I really think that especially Park Place has kind of been left out in the cold for a long time. Um, you know, we've we've heard about the parks issue and now we're hearing about this issue. I, I do think that we're going to have to really look hard at what we're going to do with Holcomb Boulevard. You know, as we continue to add housing in that neighborhood, it, it cannot much longer maintain it being a two lane road. So there's all those things to talk about. But when I talk about uh, budget and in the scheme of things, $300,000 is not a whole lot of money. Uh, Commissioner Smith, you have anything for us? No. Commissioner O'Donnell? No, Mayor, I'm totally in agreement with your statement. Commissioner McGriff? Uh, yes, John, just uh, a question since it's been a while since I knew what the cost of a uh, pedestrian act activated signal is. I remember the last figure was some years back, they were around $14,000. That was, that sounds right for the actual equipment. Equipment, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I would concur. Um, I know that every time I go visit someone in Park Place, uh, it is, you have to resist having somebody ride your bumper because you're going the speed limit and they want to race up the hill let alone trying to cross the street, which is another place to take your life in your hands. I do. I will say that I agree with you, Mayor, that about the, the crosswalk by the plaid pantry, but I will tell you, since I've been going up and down the street almost every other day um, and after dark, I will say that some of our pedestrians in that particular area wear dark clothing. They are wearing black. Oh, and there's no question. Yeah. And that's so, no yeah, but I'm not saying mind. I'm blaming the victim, but yes, that would be a place where it would be appropriate to have some additional uh, safety features because people just step off the curb, the drivers are distracted, and it is, you know, I just don't want to have happen there has happened at Pearl. So we know that so, we know that the Barclay Hills one is going to come first. The school district and their project near the police station is a priority. And we've kind of committed to Gaffney Lane on the Gaffney Lane one right near the school there. We had that, we have got, we own that piece of property. We would like to widen that out and finish that one. And our, you know, our, our effort has been towards moving forward with the Holcomb neighborhood as well through a grant program. Well, it seems to me you've gotten some direction from the commission to move these much farther up on your priority list. So. Um, you know, work with whoever you need to work with. If you need money, come see us. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I think another thing that would be helpful too is that uh, when we do get those projects underway, I think it would be helpful to have um, the police liaisons emphasize to the neighborhood association meetings that pedestrians also have a responsibility. Sure. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're talking about all sides of the coin of this. So there's, there's some education that has to go both ways. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't disagree. One of, Thank the, you. one of the pieces that I think is interesting, there's four locations on Holcomb. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what we heard from the neighborhood was that there was interest in one further down near Swan, but the pedestrian counts for that were pretty low, right? There was like three pedestrians a day or three pedestrians during the park. The, the well, time. again, and then up, like up I said, at, up at the other end, we would there like was, to be proactive rather than reactive. Right. But I uh, just think pedestrian it's... counts now might not be there, but considering all this development that's going on Get ahead uh, of the and game. the sheer volume of traffic with the few pedestrians that may be there would be possibly saving lives. Okay. Thank you, Mr. LaSalle. I appreciate you coming in. Well, thank you so much for your time and please remain healthy. All right. Thank you too. You as well. So we're up to citizen comment. Uh, do we have anybody for says comment? Oh. None. Okay. Um, then we'll go to everybody okay with the agenda? Yeah. All right. I'd like, I'd like to call an item. Where? From the consent agenda? Yes. Oh, we're not there yet. This is just the regular agenda. But, but, 
I'm sorry. We would like to know which item it is, if that's okay. Okay, so what item are you talking that. about? Yeah, eight, um, eight B or no, uh, eight A. The oh election. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, under public hearings, we have 20-263, first reading of ordinance number 20-1007, vacating a section of right-of-way adjacent to 13735 Lazy Creek Lane, Mr. Lewis. Well, I'm hopeful you're familiar with this little piece of roadway. We've been, uh, we, it's been around for a while. It's mostly been private for many, many years. So on the Malal Avenue side, it's a, it had been a private uh, facility that has recently through development become public. And then on the other side, which is more of the Gaffney Lane uh, side of the school or side of the roadway, there's another dead end there. And this project, this is a development driven request. Uh, connects those two pieces to make them a through street. So it's, um, we think that the vacation is recommended. So we're uh, recommending that you approve the first reading of this ordinance to vacate that section of right of way. The existing section of Lazy Creek Lane right of way, which is proposed to be vacated, does not align with the Lazy Creek Lane Street section uh, with right of way to the east. So the, the Malala Avenue piece and um, in the code, there's four pieces of criteria and we think this section meets it. And um, it, at the end of the day, this project would result in a, um, would help to establish a subdivision that would provide housing in uh, Oregon City. So we're recommending that you uh, approve the ordinance and answer any questions. Uh, any questions out there in Zoom land? Okay, Commissioner Lyle Smith, anything? Commissioner McGriff? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, was this the one that we had discussed previously a few months ago that there was something to do with some sort of a drainage system that needed to be someplace that wasn't where it was supposed to be? Right, mm -hmm. this is the one. Okay, that's what I was recalling. Is there a motion? Sure. Because I have I have talked to staff and they've and I have been um, reassured of mm -hmm. the direction that staff feel like this is an okay move. Um, even though I I will say I did have some concerns about it, but um, I have been reassured. So I'm going to make the motion for the first reading of ordinance number 20-1007, vacating a section of right of way adjacent to 13735 Lazy Creek Lane. Second. Moved and seconded, Ms. Richter. Ordinance number 20-1007, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City vacating a section of right-of-way adjacent to 13735 Lazy Creek Lane. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, so first of all, I'm going to have to open the public hearing. Is there any testimony for, in the public hearing for this item? Hearing now, I'll close the public hearing and call the roll just to make things all legal and proper. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith. Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday. Aye. Moving on general business, PC 20-0077. Second reading of ordinance number 20-1005, amending the natural resource overlay district and approving legislative file LEG 19-06, Ms. Turway. Thank you very much. Uh, we asked the commission for a second reading. I'm here to answer any questions. Okay, you beat the source pretty hard last time. Does anybody have anything else? Is there a motion? Still don't like it. Move the second reading. I'll second. Moved and seconded uh, for the discussion. Call roll. Public hearing. Oh, public no, hearing. this isn't a public hearing. Oh, no, it's not. It's no, the ordinance. Oh, sorry, Ms. Richter, second reading. Ordinance number 20-1005, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City amending the Natural Resources Overlay District, NROD. Call roll. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Denise McGriff. 
Spain. Commissioner <laughs> Commissioner Frank O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith? Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday? Aye. PC 20-078, second read of ordinance number 20-1006, Thimble Creek Concept Plan, Bucher Road Concept Plan, Code and Zoning Amendments, Legislative File 19-03, Ms. Turway. Thank you very much. At the last city commission hearing, we closed the record and the commission voted on the first reading. Um, since that time today, we received a request of written comment from Elizabeth Grazer Lindsay. And so the city commission needs to make a choice if we reopen the record and accept that testimony or keep the record closed um, and then ask for a second continuance. If this commission would like to reopen the record, we would request a continuance to June 17th. Um, the comments or detailed comments regarding adequacy of infrastructure and staff would like to add additional information at that detailed level into the record. And at June 17th, we would come back and again, ask for the second reading. So we'd start back over. If the commission would like to keep the record closed, then we would request a second continuance. We believe that we have enough information and findings in the record now to move forward with the second reading. It's just, if you want to accept this testimony, then we'd request a continuance. Generally speaking, uh, the commission policy has been that once a record is closed, we don't accept new testimony. Um, does anybody wish to, to change that policy for this particular item? I, I'm willing to accept this testimony. The letter was fairly specific, erased specific issues. I don't think it, uh, I think it is worthy of a response by staff as Specifically, it dealt with uh, water supplies and infrastructure to supply this development and uh, relationships with other agencies. So for that reason, I'm willing to, to reconsider it. Go ahead, Commissioner. Um, I would tend to agree with Commissioner O'Donnell. I want to make this as strong as possible because I do not want to see it come back to us on some sort of an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals and anything we can do to further enhance the record would be in our best interest. Normally I would not, I would agree with you and I would not be interested in, in opening the record, but this was very specific. Whatever circumstances occurred, and I know with the COVID and everybody getting kind of sideways on things that maybe the deadline passed and they were not aware, but I think you have, as you stated, Mr. Way, you have adequate information that you can add to this to further uh, substantiate our findings. And, and uh, if you feel that, that, that you have that, please do that. Commissioner Lyle Smith. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I know what public comment we're talking about. Is it the, is it already right on? Right here, I can, I, I wasn't gonna pass it out unless we were gonna accept it in the record and did you review send it. it. Out to us I before? did not, so I don't know so, how Commissioner Frank O'Donnell received it. So I feel like some people have seen it and some people have, not yeah i i did not send that out so well, he must have received it there's, there's no it problem with with distributing it and you can reject it from the record just reading it doesn't make it part of the record so we can distribute it um i don't believe that there is anything there that is particularly new um but uh, well here's a problem i have commissioner smith do you have any way to read this I didn't get it, I don't think. Well, then let me, uh, uh, Ms. Ricks is gonna email it to you. Um, I'm gonna move this down the agenda. We're gonna come back to this at the end uh, and take a look at it to give everybody a chance to read this. Um, I'm still gonna be opposed because, well, we'll just come back to this after we get done with, uh, we'll put this on as seven, D, well, after seven E. So we're gonna move on to 7C, which is 20-268, establishment of an economic development strategic plan exec steering committee, Mr. Conkle. Uh, thank you. And I will go get Mr. Graham, who is coming right now. We moved quickly. Surprise. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission, 
City Manager, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to um, uh, recommend the establishment of a Economic Development Strategic Steering Committee. There's an old saying, if you don't plan, you plan to fail. And um, in that spirit, we recommend this action. This committee is comprised of some of the some of the best minds in our city, some of the best minds in our region, and some of the best minds on the, on the state level. And it's, and the, and it's uh, charged with creating a framework as we come out of COVID-19. We will have a different world after COVID-19. And uh, some businesses will disappear, some industries will disappear, some new ideas will reappear. But for certain, it will not be what we see today. This uh, strategic plan, we envision to have at least three features, certainly more, but at least three that I'm particularly f uh, looking forward to. Public participation is, is one of them. And a lot of communities uh, put forth economic development strategies and they uh, tend to want to grow for growth's sake. But I think in this case, it's important to get feedback from the public so they can define what growth means to them. So it needs to be appropriate for the community. The second uh, feature is a development and investment policy. It is important that we not let the tail wag the dog in this community. Uh, that means that many times uh, it, well, it's important to allow a project help us get uh, help us fulfill a, a, a mission or strategy instead of choosing a developer or, or letting a piece of property be developed because it looks nice or it is uh, someone has asked us that they want to develop it. So uh, it's important to have a, a, an investment policy that helps us uh, fulfill the mission of the, uh, of the uh, strategic plan. And the third uh, component of this uh, plan is the recognition that we need to identify new technological innovations, new companies, new, uh, new ways of doing things. For one thing is certain, uh, as we come out of COVID, the great investments will be those that are agile, that are, that are speedy, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, in innovation is gonna be the main uh, thrust, it's gonna be extreme innovation and a lot of data. And uh, uh, industries like telemarketing, not telemarketing, uh, telemedicine, will be very, very important. Industries like uh, more infrastructure, uh, investment in infrastructure like uh, high-speed transportation and trains. So all in all, this is what we're recommending, knowing that the future is gonna be different. We're recommending uh, the following individuals uh, on the committee. Uh, Wyatt Parno from the, our director of finance uh, department, uh, Laura Turway uh, from the community development department, uh, Sarah Heckman, uh, uh, Deputy Director of Business and Community Service from the County, Lisa Davison, uh, Executive Director of Connections with Business and Industry, uh, Matthew Miller, who is the CEO, Interim President of Greater Portland, Inc., uh, Lynn Wallace, Workforce Analyst and Economist of Oregon Employment De uh, Department, uh, Michael Myers, who's another economist, uh, of, uh, his focus is on business uh, in commerce. Uh, He's from, not wearing a hockey mask. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brian, uh, Brian uh, Guinea, who is a regional development director, uh, also from uh, Business Oregon. Uh, Teresa Hawkins from PGE. Uh, Victoria Minning, our own uh, Oregon City Chamber of Commerce. And Bridget Daisy, executive director of Clackamas Workforce Partnership. And of course, we are looking to you to appoint one of your own uh, to this. Uh, Actually, there'll be two. So it'll be myself and Commissioner O'Donnell. Well, then there, there you go. So uh, that is our recommendation uh, to the committee. And also we are asking it to, it to be an ad hoc kind of situation where there, whereby once a document is presented to you and it's approved, that ad hoc committee goes away so that we can now implement the plan. Okay, questions? Commissioner Lyle Smith. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious, has there ever been an economic development strategic plan before created in Oregon City? There has mm -hmm. actually been two. Okay. Uh, sort of. Sort of. 
<laughs> okay. Not an active one that we're no, we're no. implementing. Okay. And then my second question is, I feel like there's a nexus here with the with the comprehensive plan visioning. And so I'm wondering, is is that in your plan where these two programs should coalesce somewhere along the way? Exactly. You've read my mind and everybody else's. Um, it, it, many times, a, com, a lot of communities have a comprehensive plan and then they have an economic development plan and the two don't talk together. And in this situation, uh, we we want to, uh, Ms. Torway is on our uh, economic development strategic uh, committee as well as we want to invite the economist that's going to be working on the comprehensive plan to be a part of the discussion. So it's, it's very important that they speak uh, they, they, they're headed in the same direction. Of course, as you know, a comprehensive plan is like 30,000 miles on, above mm -hmm. the ground. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, the economic development strategy is a little closer to the ground and we'll have very specific initiatives to, uh, to activate. Yeah, I'm just thinking that, you know, through the visioning process that we heard about earlier in our work session, I mean, I imagine we, we will get some feedback or hopefully we will get some feedback from our community about what they see as far as drivers in our community and what's needed on the ground and so that, you know, that can help feed the strategic plan of the economic development steering committee. I, I think it's great though. I'm really happy that you're doing it. Thank you. Commissioner O'Donnell, you got any for us? Well, simply that I'm honored to do this and I'm doing it because in a very short period of time, I've developed an incredible amount of confidence in Mr. James Graham. I see things that we need to do in a way of economic development. Uh, for example, the Thimble Creek piece, you know, where all of a sudden our focus isn't on the, the job creation part of it, it's on the residential piece again. And I want to get the job creation ahead of the residential piece. And I'm volunteering because of my experience in uh, economic development, business development for a $6 billion corporation and having headed up the United States from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, I, I think I have something to contribute. I'm glad the mayor is also volunteering for the position. So thank you. I look forward to serving. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Um, I guess my only question would be, um, I'm very supportive of this, obviously, and um, I just want to make sure that we're not um, siloing um, economic development and tourism and all these other pieces. We're definitely doing um, you know, implementing committees to kind of focus on specifically on certain areas. But then the question is, how do those, how do those groups that we're creating interact with each other um, in a way that they're all working for the same message and vision? Because I, if we are creating these separate things, I don't see really any reference in this um, proposal of, of tourism. So those things need to all work together. And, and I know that I'm assuming, um, you know, our staff knows that and is striving towards that. And, and so I'm just hoping that, you know, um, that'll be a little bit more solidified as we go on how those groups are going to interact and work together on this on, on economic development. Commissioner McGriff. Well, I couldn't be more pleased by this. This is a particular um, interest of mine. Uh, I spent my career doing much of this type of work. And uh, I think it's very important that we have uh, guidance, just as uh, Mr. Graham stated, we do not want the tail wagging the dog. Oregon City is at a point in its history that we can tell folks that who we want and who we might not be appropriate for our community. It's not everybody that comes through the door is something that maybe our community wants or needs, but we have the right to say yes or no. And if we have a plan and policies that back that up, it makes it much easier. And we also have an opportunity to go out and solicit specific programs, plans, and development community members that would be uh, in the best interest of our community. So I, I overwhelmingly and strongly support this and I uh, make a motion. Um, just give me a second. Um, so. When we went out to hire an economic development manager and I read the initial uh, resumes and then we had our uh, meeting here where we interviewed the candidates, um, Mr. Graham immediately jumped to the top of my list. Uh, I was looking for somebody who had 
a, a depth and breadth of experience that we had not had in economic development in Oregon City. And we were extremely fortunate to get Mr. Graham to, to come and, and be part of the team here. And this is exactly the kinds of thing that I was hoping for us to have is someone who understood the entire uh, sphere of economic development and could put together the policies and procedures and, and actions in place to make that go forward. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I, I would do want to say to Commissioner Smith, I believe that both tourism and economic development come under Mr. Graham's leadership. So I'm pretty sure that he's going to know what's going on in both sides. So, uh, you know, I, I'm confident that, that we can move this forward. I would entertain a motion now. I would like to move that we approve the establishment of an economic development strategic plan steering committee. I'll second. Second. Move the second and third and fourth. So call the roll, please. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rachel Lau Smith. Aye. Dan or Mayor Dan Holiday. All right. Thank you, Mr. Graham. We appreciate it. I think I have another item, don't I? Well, I don't know. I'm still working down my uh, my next. list here. Yeah, you do. So 20-270 community showcase and use of gift certificates, Mr. Conkle. Are you just passing it off to I Mr. Am. Graham? It once again, yes. Mr. Graham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this um, program is actually one of five that uh, will be, that is uh, being viewed as our implementation of the uh, tourism strategic plan. As you know, there has been a strategic, a tourism strategic plan for, and it's been on the shelf for two years. And it's, uh, it's now time to implement it. And this is one of the programs, one of five that will, will do that. The, um, one of the things in the, in the uh, one of the things that I've read in the tourism strategic plan uh, it said that uh, it, in order to be authentic, that the public have to be supportive of tourism. And if, if, you, if it doesn't start at home, then it's not authentic. And so this is what the, uh, the community showcase is de designed to, uh, to be, to engage our very own citizens into learning more about what Oregon City has to offer and to incentivize them so that they can uh, enjoy what their community has. Now, there are lots of people who have not, uh, since the changes of, that have occurred downtown, there are lots of people that haven't, have yet to see the changes. And some of, and then there are others that have seen it and said one, had wondered what had happened. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of things going on, uh, a lot of things going around in, in terms of this entire city. And uh, it's, I think it's important that people learn uh, more about their community. So with that said, um, uh, there are people who also need to learn about the history of Oregon City. And so this, uh, this uh, program is designed to help them uh, learn more about their community, but also bring forth the new part of, of the community, the restaurants and other things that they can be engaged in. So, by, um, it, so it brings together two worlds. Now, uh, Matthew Weintraub uh, is here and he's gonna explain to you, uh, give you information on the technical aspects of the, uh, of the uh, community showcase, and then I'll be back. Oh, he was over there, okay, go ahead, I didn't know you were. Okay, go ahead. Came in silently. Yeah. Um, right, so thank you, James. Um, so our, our goal here you are? is, what? oh, Matthew Weitraub, uh, Tourism Program Specialist, Morgan City. Um, our goal here um, is really to not only provide um, a view into the past for our residents, but also to help spark some economic recovery. Um, one of the things in the tourism industry around the state we have been discussing is that we have the opportunity to use uh, many of the tools at our disposal in our industry to help aid in economic recovery um, as we pull out of what has been an unprecedented time. Um, and so this program will be providing virtual tours of some of Oregon City's historic sites and hopefully building to all of them. Um, we'll be partnering with the Museum of the Oregon Territory, so it's Clackamas um, County Historical Society, and also the Oregon City Parks and Recreation Department, Oregon City Library, um, to help that initial wave of virtual tours of both Museum of the Oregon Territory and city-managed uh, historic sites. Um, we'll be hosting this virtually, so on TravelOregonCity.com, 
um, and then also on Museum of the Oregon Territory site. Following this, uh, people we will be encouraging and marketing this to residents um, instead of visitors so that residents have an, an opportunity to experience the past and experience their city. Um, and then we'll be encouraging them to take a short quiz. Um, as kind of we said in the staff report, these are, these are not gonna be very in-depth questions. This won't look like an ACT or an SCT quiz, but just to kind of test that people, people did go on these virtual tours and then entering them if they, if they pass the tests correctly, the quiz correctly, uh, entering them in a, a drawing to win a gift certificate at a local restaurant. Um, and we're, we're asking for some funding there from the um, OC Business Debt Relief Initiative. Um, but yeah, our hope here is, is not only to uh, provide this view into the past, but also to knock off some of our goals with the tourism strategic plan, um, right? It ties directly into our first imperative by championing the value of tourism, by getting our residents to really understand this, the historic past, but also understand what there is to do and see in Oregon City. Um, and then also um, it helps us develop a, a plan and promote existing experiences so people they know what's going on here. Um, at that point, let me turn it back over to you, James. Yes. So, uh, all in all, um, it is one where we want to use. We want to actually uh, uh, use twenty thousand uh, dollars, sixteen some odd thousand dollars from the, uh, uh, which is a remaining amount from the Oregon City Business Debt Relief uh, Initiative, and a little over three thousand uh, dollars, three thousand eight hundred twenty-three dollars and forty-nine cents from the general fund, bringing the total to twenty thousand dollars. So, uh, uh, any questions? Okay. Um, I gave my thing back up. Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Smith. Um, couple of questions. So, um, there was references to city owned slash city managed, and and clearly that uh, narrows down quite a bit of our location. So, um, is the the end of the Oregon Trail is owned by the city, not managed by the city, and the Hermitinger House is managed and owned by the city. Um, so is the Interpretive Center included in that? All of our, all of the sites, historic sites are included in this, uh, whether that, whether or not they're city owned or not. We're just simply saying these sites because uh, we want to start with them. And some of them already have the capacity to be on, a, to, to go through a virtual tour. Others will have to work with to build a virtual mechanism so that people can enjoy uh, the, the museum or the house. I guess I'm, I'm a little worried about, um, you know, launching it piecemeal rather than um, the supporting of all the museums. And I know that everyone's kind of in a different place with that. But um, in terms of the virtual tour, I mean, um, you know, if we really want to get the biggest bang for a buck that should be something that is um you know involving all the heritage sites and and really would be more aligned with what we're trying to do to be consistent with all the heritage sites um, if we launch this with just city-owned buildings and 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 one museum that is kind of ready to go then it really doesn't show that we're all invested um equally in in moving forward as a city um, in, in opening our tourism attractions. The other thing is, you know, this is a 10 month program. Um, I think it was stated, uh, or the plan is to be that. Um, in 10 months, um, you know, how many of these facilities will be open and why wouldn't we be encouraging them to really visit the sites? Um, and so I, I think, you know, I appreciate the virtual piece of it, but um, you know, that's going to be a little bit short lived in, in the sense that, you know, if, if the museums can get open as soon as possible when they when they're able to, uh, we should definitely be focusing our attention and getting them into the buildings. Um, so I guess that would be my main comments. Um, I'm supportive of this um, in a general concept, and I definitely think it's important to tie our heritage sites um, with the reopening of restaurants and the reopening of the city in a way that encourages our citizens to get out there and support the community. And if, if they have, you know, some family visiting this summer, that maybe they can direct them to these places. Um, the, um, let's see, what else? So is it, it's Rotator that would, Rotator Creative would be doing the, um, 
actual creation of these virtual tours? Uh, Rotator will be working on the working on our um, on our tourism website. Uh, the the uh, virtual tours, uh, yes, they would be involved in that as well. Uh, but the, the, so, but okay, the, so now, go ahead. Okay, so now I'm confused. If we're actually creating these virtual tours, or we're just we're just uh, um, promoting existing virtual tours that the individual attractions have already created, and that's why they're specific. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll, I'll go back to your, your first kind of question there is, is why we're doing just the city-owned sites in one museum at this point. It's that um, we have the ability, like I said, to work with our parks department, who's already starting to create some virtual content for the Ermitinger House. Um, and we're also working, like I said, with the library department, who have all of the content ready to go, just not in a video folk form, for these other city-owned sites. So this will actually allow us to expedite the launch of this program. And then we've already been in contact with many of the other privately owned historic sites. They know this is coming and we'll be working with them to get their digital uh, uh, content ready to go. Many of them are unable to create it at this point just because their staff are uh, collecting unemployment, for example, and they're just not able to work. Um, but they are aware of this program and they will be working with us to, to upload their, their content. Um, so what about the end of the Oregon Trail? As I, as I said, we're, we've because we're, in one set in one in one sentence you said um, in one sentence you said city managed buildings in one you said city owned buildings, it's two different things, and they're not the same. So yeah, um, like, is the interpretive center part of this or not? Gail, they will be, but Gail, they don't have the staff online currently to to, to execute. Mr. Graham? Gail, yes, Gail is aware of this, and uh, she, all of these sites will be a part. But as you recognized yourself, everybody's at different places of development. So it's going to be difficult to implement everything everywhere at one time. You want to, you want to, you want to present the city at this point carefully and safely and, and build upon the confidence of people to come to visit us. But at this point, people are just not comfortable. And that's, that's what we're dealing with right now. Okay, Commissioner O'Donnell. In general, I'm in favor of the program. I've got, I want the, the package to be a total package. I think about other historic offerings. I don't want people to be under the impression that this is all we've got to offer this limited amount. When I think about places like the Rose Farm and the Stevens Crawford House, and I'd like to consolidate all that into an offering because it's really an incredible offering. And, so when we go back to the previous discussion about economic development and Commissioner Rocky Smith's statement, I mean, it, it, to me, it's the totality of the package. You want to put everything you can out there to say, to show that you want to visit. So I understand the, the difficulties caused by this current situation. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I agree with the program. The question is the timing. And obviously, you know, I would be, in, I would prefer that the people did in-person visits, but that's a whole other issue but if nothing else we include these other future offerings to our tourism package so people can see more than just a limited offering my thoughts thank you Commissioner Law smith yes uh thank you mayor um so when i looked through the staff report i was surprised i guess i felt like the the budget was only for the gift certificate program and i was wondering why there wasn't a budget for the virtual tours um or for the virtual tour creation. So it sounds like we're completely reliant on these individual locations to come up with a virtual tour or either have resources to add to it. That we're, we're not, it's hard for me to gauge, like is there a piece of the tourism budget or anything like that that's working on putting together the virtual tours or it sounds like, no, we're not well, doing that. Well, Rotator uh, is, as you know, is they will be working with us. They are already on ret retainer. So that's part of the budget. So uh, it's part of their retain uh, their retainer. So it's 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 uh, it's already built in. So they're producing the virtual tours for all of the sites. So all of the sites. Okay. Commissioner McGriff. Yes, thank you. My questions really sort of involve the. Uh, I understand the uh, gift card situation, and I support that. I came in and talked to James about it earlier when we were having a discussion about something else. So the. I think it would behoove us to, as I think I heard you say that we are going to be phasing into virtual tours. So when you talk about 
a virtual tour? Are we talking about a full tour of that facility or are we talking about a teaser? Because the reason I'm asking is that in order to entice them to come to the museum, we can't give away the whole show. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> we have to say, here's this, this, and this, and if you want to know more, when our doors open, you're going to come, come see us. And that's exactly right. And you, and you have to give them a little bit and then give them some information about the facility or the, or the situation so that they can, they can have more interest later. But it's important to provide, recognize that we have to do it safely. And it's also important to recognize that different facilities, different sites are not at the same place. So I understand and appreciate uh, the desire to offer everything at once, but you have to keep in mind that if you, if you delay this while we are in competition with other communities, and we are definitely in competition with other communities that also have offerings, we're just trying to get to the marketplace soon, as, as soon as possible. And that's the important thing. Um, and, 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 and it's best to, it's, it's best to provide uh, insight on, it's best to, to show facilities that are ready to go uh, so that you put your best foot forward, but you don't have to put all your feet forward. And that's, that's the important thing to consider because we are in competition with other communities and that's important to keep that in mind. Some of you know I've been up at the Holmes house almost every day for the last since March, I'm painting. So you're telling me I need to get speed up my painting project to get the house ready to be Safely. on a tour. Safely. <laughs> okay, okay, so I um, got that. Uh, the one thing I want to say, and I understand where Commissioner Smith is coming from, but uh, I, I have had to use this particular saying a couple times in the last couple months, and we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, that uh, uh, we hired Mr. Graham to do these things and I'm gonna rely on his professional skills and abilities to start us moving forward. Uh, I've spent 25 years hearing stuff about tourism that's never taken place because we never get anything started. So um, the one thing I, I, I do question is, is, um, is picking 10 restaurants. Um, and, and I think that um, that this should be something that could be used in a restaurant at the grocery outlet at, you know, Maisie Mays or whoever it is. I, I have a hard time picking winners and losers as far as that particular point is concerned. And if you can figure out a way to address that, you don't have to come back and tell me about it. But I'd like to see it be more than just... And restaurants because we have a lot more other business offerings than just restaurants in Oregon City. Commissioner Smith, yeah. not Lyle Smith, sorry. <laughs> that that was actually gonna one of my other questions was how how are you picking the businesses that give get the gift cards? I mean, we had a, a whole set of 70-ish businesses or something like that that we gave grant funds to. And this is using funds that we had targeted for small businesses to help in this. So I assume I'm kind of making the assumption that maybe you're picking businesses that would fall into that same category of small businesses that needed assistance, but there's, I, it, it may have been in the staff report, and if I missed it, I'm sorry, but um, how are you picking the businesses? There are 112 business, uh, restaurants in this city, and we are picking, well, first of all, you, you, with that fact, you also start with uh, the restaurants that have um, business licenses in the city. And then, uh, then you take that group and you just put them in a hat. It's ran they're randomly chosen. It's 10 restaurants each month, and they have to be different. But 10, ref 10 different restaurants each month. And the reason we're doing that is concentration of impact, economic 101. You have to really uh, make an impact, and, they have to, and the restaurants need to see that impact. Because if you, if you have 50 people in one month visiting these 10 restaurants, it's an impact for them because now you have only 10, they don't have to compete with 112. And it, it, it really makes a very solid uh, uh, impact as opposed to diluting it and no one notices it. So did you pick restaurants because you felt like that was the industry that was impacted the hardest or the most with the COVID? They, we're we're going to lose a lot of restaurants and we, we just need to, to uh, support them. And I'm very concerned about them. Okay, I'll accept that answer. Anything else? Commissioner Smith. Have, Commissioner I have Smith. more. 
So some of my questions didn't get answered. Um, this is a 10 month, this is slated to be a 10 month program, correct? Correct. So are you saying at what point in that 10 months will all these sites have um, virtual tours? Well, as fast as possible, um, but actually uh, is our expectation as, as hard as we will be working with them, we expect everybody to be up and running in 90 days. So, so three, uh, that's, that's just the fact of it. Um, but the, the, the answer to the mayor, or I think it was the mayor that asked the question, is Rotator creating all these virtual tours? Well, and I think the answer was yes, but that doesn't make sense if we're starting this process on virtual tours that are already created by the individual organizations, and that was not done by Rotator. I know that. So that doesn't seem to, the answers don't make sense. Well, yeah. some, some um, if you're if we're, if we're creating tours based uh, virtual tours based on what we already have, those weren't created by Rotator. That's true. Some some uh, facilities have so, have come farther along. It's okay to use them, but we, we, we right. Just, but it, but the mayor asked if Rotator was doing all the virtual tours, and the answer was yes. So that's all, not true. All those that all those that need to be developed, uh, but well, no. I guess. Go ahead. I, I guess my point is this, the Ermatinger House currently doesn't have one, right? The, right? They've started the process, but doesn't actually have one created. Is that right? You want to answer that? Yeah, so the Ermatinger House actually is managed, managed by the city, right, known by the city. They actually have some of these kind of teaser videos that we will be using as tours. So not give like- That were created by Rotator? Created by city staff. And actually to answer uh, Commissioner Lyle Smith's and, question as so well earlier. I, 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 we're not, I'm not, I'm just not getting straight answers. And, and um, I, I guess my point is, um, so Rotator, we have gone on retainer, but they really aren't doing the work that is that we're starting with. Um, and my point is, is if we're paying Rotator to design a virtual tour for the Irma Tinger House, why aren't we paying them to do all the sites of the city uh, equally? Because the website is, is uh, Travel Oregon City, not Travel the Irma Tinger House. And, and then let the, you know, do the basic full tour, virtual tour. And as, as the individual attractions get more, um, uh, um, get more, you know, um, material or more um, uh, substance to their the information that they're posting, they can put that together. I just don't, um, I, I just don't really see um, if we're, you know, creating something from scratch already with the Irma Tinger House, it makes sense that if this is truly about supporting Travel Oregon City, then we should be starting with a basic full, these are all the attractions, and maybe at this point, this is all this attraction has as part of the virtual tour, but at least we could give the basics. And I think, um, Ms., uh, I think Commissioner McGriff makes up an important point. Um, so far in Oregon City, one of the biggest, um, abilities for us to promote our heritage sites and businesses in the past five years has been working with the Rose Festival and doing Heritage Days. Well, Heritage Days, we do a tour of the, the, the sites. Um, and we do it by bus, and we're very specific not to give them too much information. It's, it's, it's very much a, a, a hint of what the history of that place is so that people will go to these uh, sites. And I, I find it really hard to believe that in 10 months, these sites aren't gonna be allowing visitors to come in. And if we are still working on virtual tours in 10 months of some of the sites, I, I don't see the point in doing it. Well, Commissioner, I think you missed the point that Mr. Graham said in that he expects to have all the sites done within 90 days. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do, Mr. Smith, um, Commissioner Smith. I, I think that you have a much deeper discussion to have with Mr. Graham and his staff. Um, I, I would encourage you to come in and sit down on, in a one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Conkle and Mr. Graham and, and the other staff to, to answer and explain your questions. Because, you know, for me, I think better to start with something than not to start at all. I, I agree with that. But but not just one or two sites. I mean, it, it, we can start with something, and it could be a it could be what the whole mission is is uh, travel Oregon City, not I travel the city buildings that the city owns. 
I understand, and I would encourage you to come in and have that discussion with staff. Um, I, I think I've this is a, all I need to say. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Commissioner Les Smith. Yeah, so it, it sounds like it would be really good um, to hear, and it can be distributive information. Of, of let us know what is your plan for developing virtual tours. Is there a schedule? Can you show that you're going to hit all of them? And, and then there's an equitable distribution and promotion of our sites. It would be good to have that information. It wasn't in the staff report. The other piece is it sounds like the program needs to be able to transition to in-person visits at the particular museum. So maybe six months down the road, it moves to where people show up, they sign up for a drawing for the gift certificate because they visited the site. And maybe that's how the program transitions to balance between virtual tours and in-person tours. So there's clearly a concern here. It would be really great if you could go back and kind of tweak it or work on it and then, you know. I'm gonna make a suggestion here. Um, I, I, I think we're 95% there. Yes, we are. Yeah. But uh, I think, you know, in, in construction, 95% is easy. The last 5% is really hard. Um, so uh, I think rather than try to try to beat this to death tonight, why don't you take the next two weeks or so and work with Commissioner Smith and any other folks that have some input and see if you can get us that last 5% and bring it back to our next meeting in June. Is that acceptable that's fine i just wanted to say that before this uh, covid 19 hit i was it, it, it was our intention to do this in person all of this in person sure uh, yeah but you know as as all of you know when you start a plan uh, it's going to be tweaked as you go along it has to be and then uh, as as more opportunity comes uh, you include that opportunity so I, I don't want you to think that just because we're starting this way we'll end up that way it, chances are we'll have a, a better program and more offers, offerings, and, uh, and it may take a different turn and, and invite more uh, individuals that might be able to uh, commit more resources to it. So uh, uh, please keep that in mind. Well, in the military, we had a saying, improvise, adapt, and overcome. And yeah. so that's what I expect you to do. So uh, with that, we'll move on. Um, and I think we're going to take a five minute break right now. We'll come back at like 10 till because five minutes always takes 10 minutes. Um, and uh, we'll take care of that temporary shower and then we'll take a look at that last item we had that we put off to the end of the meeting. So we'll come back at 10 minutes to nine. We back on. He's ready? Yep. Okay. So we'll call back to order and um, we're, we're on 7E 20-287, temporary shower trailer at Clackamas County's facility located down to Abernathy in Oregon City, Mr. Conkle. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Evening, Commissioners. Uh, so tonight I'm here to present a, a proposal for a temporary shower trailer at Clackamas County's facility on Abernathy Road. Um, as you may recall, we've had a previous hearing about this concerning uh, locating this uh, shower trailer at uh, Father's Heart. Uh, Father's Heart did uh, was able to reopen, but on a, a, a limited basis. Uh, so as the COVID-19 uh, event uh, continues, um, traditionally Father's Heart was able to offer 108 showers weekly uh, with the restrictions that are in place for physical distancing, cleaning the facility after each use and whatnot. It's been drastically limited to about 40 showers per week. Uh, the proposed plan would to bring the trailer to the Clackamas Community Property parking lot on Thursdays and when needed on Fridays, the trailer to be on site for four hours and available uh, for citizens to use from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. It would be returned to the Clackamas uh, Service Center each day and will not be located on the property when not in use. Uh, during shower operations, staff will follow strict personal protection gear guidelines and the showers will be cleaned uh, between each use per CDC guidelines. Towels, clothes, and laundry services would be provided, similar to what was proposed at Father's Heart. Um, the trailer will be continued to be brought to the property until such time that the social services that traditionally provide those showering facilities pre-COVID are available again. Uh, this is not intended to be a permanent long-term facility provided on the property. Um, there, well, I did attach both the operational plan that was provided by uh, Clackamas County Emergency Operations Center, as well as a site map to uh, show where the property is for those uh, that may not be familiar with this. 
Um, uh, be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And I believe that we also have Nancy Bush from the Clackamas County Emergency Operations Center on the line uh, to answer any questions or providing the additional details that I may have missed. Well, Mr. Conka brought this to me. Um, I didn't understand why Father Sharp wasn't able to do that. He explained to me why, you know, the issues about cleaning all that stuff. And given the location here, doesn't really impact the neighborhood the way the location would at Father's Heart. I really don't have any issue with this at this point. It's it's pretty much out of sight, out of mind. Um, it's behind the fence, as I recall. Is that right? Yeah. So for, the, for those of you familiar with it, it's a, it's the Clackamas County uh, old uh, maintenance facility location. It's a pretty ex it's a pretty uh, large property, uh, very very long property along Abernethy, fenced, multiple buildings there. Um, so you would be behind fencing. Um, adequate space for physical distancing on that property um, and to provide those additional services, um, water, sewer availability. So everything that was needed uh, to provide this uh, service is available at this location. Uh, Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions? No. Commissioner O'Donnell? I do not. I read the operational plan. Commissioner McGriff? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, who are the volunteers that are going to be staffing this? Um, Not specific, but I mean, is it a group? Is it Miss Bushy county, there? County employees. Um, Hang on, Miss Bushy there. He's... Uh, there, there she is. is. Hey. There you are. Hey. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm working on my phone tonight, and it wasn't working right. Yeah, so the volunteers that we work with are those volunteers that we work with through our social services on a regular basis. Um, and we have two large groups. One of the groups is Love You, or Lo I'm sorry. Love Inc. The name of the, the, the laundry yeah, people. Thank you. Yeah, so they are part of the volunteers. And then we have other volunteers that have been working through us with the uh, EOC that are helping with the mobile showers. My second question is is that while there are not a large number of residents in that area they are along um, Abernathy and there are a few on the uh, what I call the John Adams extension because there's a big gap between that part of John Adams and the other part of John Adams and then there are several businesses across the road including the sheriff's office uh, uh, car lot or a car parking lot so are, is there going to be any notification for folks just to let them know, not, just, not for approval of anything of sort, but say, by the way, this is what we're doing? So we can do that. That was not in the plan, but that is certain, certainly something that we can do. I mean, the sheriff's office does know because um, they've been working with us on the project. Um, and so we certainly can do that. That would be great. Commissioner Smith. I don't have anything. I'm, I'm trying to understand Commissioner McGriff's concerns, but um, there's a creek between them though, right? I mean, focus no, so on Abernathy the Creek's on the back side of Old Blue, which right. is what we call that facility. And then across Abernathy, there's, there's the, the, sheriff. the sheriff's, there's the, yeah. a, like a pony Royal business flesh. or something. And then the, uh, what used to be the- I guess I, d I don't know of any residences. Yes, there's really two close. two houses mm -hmm. and the Royal Flush, which tore down. There were three houses along there. Two of them are occupied on the, what side of the street would that be? North. North side. And then there's a business and then across the street, towards John Adams and Abernathy. There are two, two, three residents, two residents there, plus uh, an office building, and then there are residents along John Adams. And, and while I understand, you know, notification, the fact is, is that all of those places are a significant distance away from where we're talking about, and we're talking about inside the fenced area at the facility. So I, I just don't see any real, you know, beyond maybe us putting something on the website, uh, spending the money to somehow individually notify those people, I just don't see as necessary for this particular function for as short term as it's going to be. I, I can't imagine we're talking about more than maybe four or six months at the outside. Um, does anybody have any objection to moving forward with this? Do you need a formal motion? Um, we were requesting one, yes. So is there a motion? 
Uh, I'll make the motion to authorize the city manager to move forward with allowing a shower trailer at Clackamas County's facility located at 902 Abernathy Road in Oregon City. Second. Moved and second. Call the roll. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith. Aye. Commissioner or Mayor Dan Holiday. Aye. <laughs> so we're back to item 7B, PC 20-078. And um, I have had an opportunity to read uh, the testimony from Ms. Uh, Grazier Lindsay. And I, I just don't find anything compelling here. I, I think that 99% of everything she's talked about, that horse has been beat to death, you know, over the last five or six years that we've been talking about this plan. Um, and I'm not interested in, in opening up the record and allowing more testimony at this point and extending this much longer than it's already been. Commissioner Smith, do you have something? Um, I, saw you, no. I saw you raising your hand, so. Commissioner O'Donnell. No. Okay, Commissioner O'Donnell. Well, I do feel that the issues she raised are have merit and in fact they're very consistent with the issues raised in exhibit 18 which was the infrastructure mem memo and which leaves a lot of questions unanswered and especially in view of our another matter we're going to deal with tonight which is our our commitment to service our local our citizenry with our south fork water district so i think what she brought up has merit and i'll leave it to my my fellow commissioners decide what, what their feeling is. Commissioner Lyle Smith. Yes, I mean, I, I, I read the, the um, comments and, and truthfully, I've had some of the same concerns um, as far as like the transportation projects. There's a whole set of them that say funding is unlikely and I have a hard time with that. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Are we moving forward with something that we are never able going to be to be able to build? Um, and so, um, I, I don't know if if allowing this to be opened back up will give um, you all a chance to address some of these concerns, or maybe what I'm missing. I, I had a couple of questions last time, but we were moving quickly, so I didn't ask them. Those are good questions. Um, so all of the issues identified in the memo are in the record and we have had lengthy discussions about each of these items. We do have master plans that were approved after the Beaver Creek Road concept plan was initially adopted. And so they do account for the capacity and the need that this project will entail or require. And so it is in there. Some of the, some of the items that she brings up um, are regarding can we serve it and how do you know it will be served and how it will be served by before development occurs. Um, we have master plans already that account for how our plan is to serve them. So we know that we can serve them and that is the requirement at this point. So we take incremental steps as development occurs. So then when development comes online, then we have to make sure that the thing is gonna be served or we deny the development. So there's more steps that happen between this step of rezoning the property and then actually serving the property and allowing development. So we do have code in place that require adequacy of infrastructure prior to development. Um, we don't have a requirement that all the development needs to be in place right now when we rezone it. And we just make, need to make sure that we have steps to know that we can get there. And we feel confident that we have that in the record. Um, if you want to leave the accept it and leave the record open um, we can certainly write things we're not going to find new evidence between now and two weeks from now we can re-summarize things that we already have summarized in and add that into the record the risk of staying open is that you're going to get other stuff too and we don't know what that other stuff is um, we can always certainly write more um, so if development were to occur say a new proposal came in. Um, essentially, we would review the application. We would probably collect SDCs or have requirements as part of that development in order to make sure that infrastructure was built or adequate for that development, right? 
Right, they'd have to have sewer sewer systems and water and things like that. So it's it kind of holds our feet to the fire a little bit to have, or or is the answer that the city just denies develop the, the development? If we can't serve it, we deny development. Correct. But we feel like we can serve it. Well, that varies across <laughs> the, the concept area. Long term, we can serve that area. Our master plans show it. it the, the wrong development at the wrong time may be an area where that development just can't really pencil to happen or afford to happen. So, so there are gonna be situations like that, but, but we can, with a long list of projects, serve that area. Commissioner Griff. My colleague, Commissioner Lyle Smith. Same comments we talked about when we were dealing with the plan. Right, and I think that uh, Ms. Turway has reasonably answered that question that uh, while we have the plan in place to, to get there, that actually having the stuff is, or the developments are contingent upon actually being able to serve those developments when they're being built. So we have, you know, that tripwire that says if, if we haven't got that stuff in place, we can't do a, an actual development, but to put the groundwork in place, to have the zoning and all the other stuff, um, this memo doesn't really affect anything that we've already done in the first reading. And so I would encourage us to do the second reading and move forward with this. I mean, it's been 18 years. Well, and it, and it seems like the, the master plans that are part of this, these edits, these updates to some of the things that are associated in this package are actually needed in order to make sure that we can and provide services, right? right? I mean, exactly. there's a direct connection there that we can only get there by updating some of these master plans in order to make sure we're collecting SDCs. I mean, this is a linear, in some cases, it is a linear process. We need to adopt these things in order to really look at it and do the SDC evaluation and analysis and make sure we're collecting funds so that we can, you know, when we get there, we do have the services and, right? Right, and right. according to staff, everything is in this memo is addressed somewhere in the record already. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And, and I give her that assessment and specifically with that uh, exhibit 18 on infrastructure, it re basically reads like, well, we'll kind of figure it out when we get closer. Well, There's I a think a number of things in the conditions of change. So I, I'll stand by my convictions, win or lose. I would reopen it and I'm prepared to take whatever outcome we get tonight. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So is there a motion either to open the record and accept the testimony or to have a second reading and final adoption. Those are your choices. Make a motion to reopen the record. Second. Call the roll. We make it specific, it's this item only. This item only to a date certain of. What? Wait, can we do that? No. What do, you, what do you mean this item only? What is No, you can't do that. So if we we're opening the record to include this. Well, but we're comment. opening the record. So the record's going to remain open so that we can return on the 17th with revised findings. And the record is open. So people can submit testimony in the interim till the record is closed. Again. <sighs> and yes. so we will come back on the 17th Presumably, with the revised findings, we will submit them into the record. You will make a decision, and we will have a first reading on the 17th. Is that the right date? So I'll make one more plea here, and that is is that we, we did this discussion. We had a first reading, and now somebody comes in after the record is closed and tosses another hanger into the mix. And so the record's gonna be open for another two weeks. And then anybody else who has some, wants to take a flyer at this thing is gonna submit more things. And then we have to do this again. How long are we gonna do that for? I mean, the staff has answered all the questions. I don't understand, but I, I, I respect where you're coming from, Commissioner O'Donnell. I'm just asking, you know, how many times are we gonna let kick this can down the road? 
not my intention. My intention is when I read Exhibit 18 and compare it to the items brought up by this citizen's letter, I think there's some valid concerns that they're answered sufficiently. And then at that point, I'd be prepared to move on. Okay. Well, I, I just want to be clear. This is not an Oregon City citizen. This is a citizen, however. Okay. So there's a motion and a second. Call the roll. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith. No. And Mayor Dan Holliday. No. Motion carries. So just to be clear, the record is open and we this matter is continued to June 17th. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that, oh, so uh, I had a request to pull something off the consent agenda. It would be number uh, 8A 20-282 resolution 20-14 colors for an election. Mr. S Commissioner Smith. So um, at the last meeting, I asked several questions regarding um, Archaeology and um, cultural uh, resources at John Storm Park. Our city staff um, provided information from the past when we did the development of John Storm Park and, and kind of answered my questions from the city's view um, from back in that in the past. But um, when the representatives from West brought this to us at our last meeting. Um, I asked specific questions um, about their plan in dealing with it. Um, there was a mention that the county had done some sort of a study and that they were willing to share that with us. They have not. Um, they have not answered any of the questions I asked at the last meeting. Um, when I asked about um, the public outreach plan. They had made no, they had made some effort, at, a, at least they said, to <laughs> contact the tribes, um, but they had not been able to do that. Um, and um, I, I just I know that this is obviously um, kind of just a, a pass through um, to put it on to um, you know the the ballot. But um, I guess my question is what what then accountability for any of this public process do they have once we we, we allow them to go forward with that? Um, my worry is, again, we're in a situation where Wes chooses to not respond to our answer or questions in any way. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not okay with that. Okay. Anyone else? What did you understand? He said that he wanted information, but then he said, we haven't gotten the information and, and he's okay with that? No, he's okay, okay with not approving oh. the, oh, not, not appro approving okay. this. Okay, and sorry. so Wes responds. And okay. to be honest, I agree with him. I didn't, I missed that little nuance. Um, Is there, Mr. Uh, Mayor, I can. Let's right. have a motion. One well, second, uh, one second here. I'm sorry. Ms. Rick. Um, so I have been in contact with Wes uh, several times since the last meeting, which was the work session on May 20th. Um, they have provided me with updated information. Unfortunately, in, within that updated information, they have not provided me with a plan on what they would do in the archaeology part of it if things were um, discovered. And I think that would be in development of continuing to move forward with this process um, once, if or once this gets approved. Um, but as far as the outreach plan, uh, in the meantime, they have met with several other people and I do have the feedback from those people and they have incorporated whatever um, comments have been um, raised on construction or on the, um, the uh, was parts. that information in the packet? No, it was not. It was okay, um, so in my email. So, okay, uh, I'll just stop you right so, there. I think we have enough. Yeah. So here, here is here is my position. That is, is that Wes is turning out to be a puppy, and we are not doing a very good job training our puppy. So uh, you know, we need to get some uh, get them to the point where they start answering our questions before we give them a treat. And so, and um, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner Sorry. Smith. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm really irritated 
um, as you know about Wes and its history, but I'm even more irritated that Wes is using our staff to bring these items to us half-baked so our staff gets to hear our wrath while they sit at home and don't even come to the meetings. Um, that is not acceptable. If, the, if Wes wants to come to us, they need to answer our questions and they need to come to the meetings. I do not disagree with you, sir. Um, is there uh, is there an issue election timeline for this? Uh, it would have to be approved um, by our August first meeting. Okay. Or our first meeting in Dennis, August. I'm sorry, I don't know. What's the pleasure the commission? Is there a motion? Is there a motion? Um, just just so I'm clear to take so that uh, yeah. West staff understands there's if I understand this correctly there's only two outstanding items is that correct it's regarding the plan on what they will do if anything is found when they're drilling is that correct Archeo well, yeah Wes, and Wes was listening to my questions at the last meeting they can answer them that's all we need to say um, so I make a motion to push this to our next meeting second Okay, so we're talking about date certain of June 17th. The motion is second to table uh, this yeah, until motion is second to table till June 17th. The motion is not debatable. Call the roll. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith. Aye. And Mayor Dan Holliday. Aye. Uh, is there a motion for the rest of the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Uh, we'll call the second on. Commissioner Smith. Uh, motion by Commissioner McGriff. Uh, Commissioner Rocky Smith. Aye. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Aye. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Aye. And Mayor, oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Rachel Lawsmith. Aye. Mayor Dan Holliday. You're promoting Rachel there for a second. Uh, <laughs> aye. Uh, Mr. Manager, you have anything for us? All right, then we're adjourned. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. What, Commissioner Communications? Nope, skip to tonight. Thanks. No, we're out of here. No, you can't do that. I, I you, can do that, and I did. You have one? Do you have something? Sorry, we're already adjourned. TV's off. The mayor can. The...
chose to cut us off and not let us speak. Um, and that's not the world we live in. And um, I, I, I'm really concerned about that. And okay. that's all I have to say. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Um, I guess I I will add on to that. I, when we had a break, I, I did have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Chief Ban and, and thanked him for um, his comments um, and his statement. I we're, We are in a challenging time where Everybody has an opinion and the opinions are on a, on a wide spectrum and it's really hard to find balance as to whether or not you should say anything, you wanna say the right thing. If you say the wrong thing, it could invoke violence, it could invoke you know, the, the wrong thing in our city. And so we're, we all have the best intentions um, in mind for our city, I believe we do, or otherwise we wouldn't be volunteering all of these hours and, and spending all of this time to try to administer the city. The city. So I, I did appreciate your statement. I, I, I believe it was heartfelt. Um, I've talked with you enough um, to know that I know that it was heartfelt, and um, I really do appreciate our police department. And I, and I see tons of positive comments for our police department. So I, I know our community loves our police department. It's just a challenging time and. And as you stated, we are we are all seeing images on the news, so we're all processing and, and dealing with it. And I can only imagine how difficult it is for our police department, which we love to to witness that and go through that and, and deal with all those emotions as well. So, um, but yeah, those are my comments. Commissioner O'Donnell, do you have anything? I won't add anything else to what has already been said because it was all right on point and correct. I had been informed by a citizen that this aspect of the uh, meeting is not being televised and I hope it will be and included when the, uh, the tape is put online for everybody to view. And that's my only comment. Thank you. Commissioner McGriff. Uh, yeah, just very briefly, I um, also uh, had talked with the chief uh, before our meeting and appreciated the fact that uh, he was being very proactive. And again, I, I agree with Commissioner Smith that our community uh, regardless of walk of life or ethnic background was looking to the city to say something. And, and uh, what was said was very simple, heartfelt. I um, feel very privileged to know most of the officers uh, in our community. And uh, it's nice when I'm driving up the street at the speed limit that I get a wave. <laughs> and I'm sure that there are people that do not like our police department, but those are the people that are doing things that they should not be doing. And they probably uh, will be getting their just desserts, but I appreciate it. And I just want our community to know that we are, we're all working together uh, to make this a better place. We all love Oregon City a great deal. And uh, again, you know, everybody needs to stay strong. And as I told uh, one of the planning commissioners, if you see something, say something. It's past time to be silent. So um, just in general communications, I think we normally report out on our committees, I believe at our work session, um, at the end of our work session agenda, we have all of our committees listed. So um, I know a lot of my committees have been canceled. Um, and uh, so I'll, I assume we'll do committee report outs at our next work session. If you have anything, <laughs> there's some that have been meeting and some that have been canceled. It's kind of been across the board, kind of a mixed bag. Um, if any other final comments or communications from the commission? And I did thank in at the meeting, I, he did accept my thank you, so. All right, hearing none, we're adjourned. <laughs>